Okay, uh, good evening. Thank you, everybody, uh, for attending. Uh, this is the October 2022 uh, Raleigh Astronomy Club meeting. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, any first time guests and visitors. Uh, if you are uh, joining us through the Zoom, feel free to put your name in there uh, and chat and say hello. Um, if you're here in the museum with us tonight, uh, feel free to kind of uh, Raise your hand later on uh, and during the kind of intermission break, uh, feel free to mingle and ask questions. So thank you. Uh, we'd like uh, to um, just ask that as we start the presentation, uh, we will basically be holding questions until the very end. Uh, you can put them in chat. Uh, and then for folks here in the um, uh, meeting room, uh, when you raise your hand, wait, and we'll pass you the mic so that the folks online can also hear the question as well. So uh, very good. So before we get started, I just want to make a couple announcements. Um, OK, so we have some upcoming events. Um, October 20th, we have our imaging uh, meeting. Also on October 20th, we have a public uh, observing night at the Morrisville Library. Uh, then on the 24th to the 30th, uh, we have the Staunton River Star Party. Now, uh, this is not an official RAC event, uh, but a lot of us will be there, um, including yours truly. Uh, on the 28th, we're going to have our monthly RAC OB, so that's the Raleigh Astronomy Club Observing Session at Big Woods and Howell Woods. Then uh, on the 2nd, we're going to have another outreach event at the Willard. On the 4th, we're going to have our first Fridays under the stars. That's at the Triangle Land Conservancy or with them uh, at the Three Bear Acres. And we'll have our next uh, club meeting uh, about prebiotic chemistry on icy worlds. And then I think we've got the imaging group meeting on the 17th. And I think all we've got is a rack. Oh, sky watching at White Deer Park. Uh, and then the last one is rack ops on the 25th, and that's the Friday after Thanksgiving. So, okay, so we're going to uh, now jump into our, oh, by the way, uh, after our meeting, uh, feel free to join us. Uh, we go to the uh, Sammy's Tap Room um, just to have either a late dinner, some dessert, uh, an adult beverage of your choice, uh, and come hang out um, and get to know us a little better. Yes, that definitely includes visitors. So uh, we're going to jump over to uh, our speaker tonight, Doug Lively. Um, so um, the presentation that Doug is going to have, if you haven't read it, uh, I'll give you a quick introduction here. So silhouetted against the majestic uh, Milky Way, stately mountains peer down uh, across pristine lakes, icy glaciers, and lush valleys of, uh, of green to provide a panorama of unparalleled grandeur and beauty that must be experienced rather than just seen. So follow Doug along the mountain trails that uh, lead him uh, into the night sky as, a, and as Doug is a Raleigh Astronomy Club member as well as a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. So Doug's gonna take us on a journey through a, an awesome summer of big sky astronomy at Glacier National Park. All right, uh, thanks for coming out, everybody. Uh, it's been four months, probably too short for you guys because <laughs> I'm back now. So, <laughs> but it's really good to see everybody. Uh, I got to tell you, we had a great time at uh, Glacier National Park tonight. Uh, tonight's program is going to talk a little more uh, than just Glacier because as we went out west, we encountered other astronomy programs at some of the other national parks. So I wanted to actually give it, uh, an homage and a shout out to them as well. But we're also going to talk a lot about Glacier National Park. And uh, how many people have been to Glacier before? Anybody? I got to tell you, it was our first time. And I, I want to tell you, it's, it was amazing. So just uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So Glacier National Park, uh, it's, my, it's my wife, Debbie, and I. We uh, also celebrated our 50th anniversary out there. And so we had a great time. Uh, this uh, stern looking fellow is me in my ranger uh, uniform. I was an interpretive ranger with Glacier National Park. Now, how I actually got selected for this program was about five years ago, got an email from Lee Redemaker, who, is, who was actually the architect of the uh, summer astronomy program at Glacier. 
And do you guys remember that? Because I kind of sent it around to everybody. Um, but anyway, uh, I kind of got in contact with Lee. Oh, I'm actually standing in front of the camera. <laughs> All right. Um, I got in contact with Lee and uh, things were going great. And then COVID hit. <laughs> And so I actually retired the year that COVID hit. So we had to, they actually shut the program down for about two years. And this summer was actually the first summer since the, uh, since the pandemic that they actually opened it up. So um, I was actually really super excited to be selected for this program. Uh, let me just uh, talk a little bit. I'm gonna go back. Um, on one thing about the program at Glacier, and I think this is important for us as, as we're exploring other uh, programs with, uh, with, with other groups like the Conservancy and everything. The, uh, the program at, uh, uh, at Glacier National Park is not so much an astronomy program on its own. What it is, it belongs to the interpretive programs, which are, uh, are uh, supported by the park. There is a Conservancy at Glacier National Park that actually puts money into all of the science-based programs out there. Science-based programs that actually go into helping uh, preserve um, nature out there. They're also doing a lot of studies with uh, sheep uh, herds, bighorn sheep herds, the uh, mountain goat herds, all types of birds and aviary. Uh, so there's a lot going on at Glacier and the, and the Conservancy supports that. And they also support volunteers. So I, again, I was a volunteer with the park, but they did help with some of our living expenses and stuff, which made it a lot easier to get out there and, and be able to spend three and a half months in the park. So just to say a little bit about Glacier and how Glacier formed, uh, this is the Glacier National Park in our, so our United States about 75 million years ago. <laughs> And 75 million years ago, which is near the end of the Cenozoic period and just before the beginning of, I'm sorry, near the end of the Cretaceous period and just before the end of the beginning of the Cenozoic period, there was this massive ocean waterway that uh, basically it was a shallow sea that actually went across our United States. And if you look right in here, we've got Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming and Nebraska. And these, uh, of course, uh, uh, these other states as well, but I just wanted to kind of focus on these four states because they really kind of form a chain of that inland sea. And if you look right here, this is actually through uh, from the Badlands of uh, South Dakota. And you can see that kind of like that big plain out there. And this whole area, 70 million years ago was underwater. Now what happened 70 million years ago, right about that time, the North American plate began um, moving towards the Pacific plate, but in the middle was a plate called the Falloran plate. And it actually subducted, actually caused that, the Falloran plate to actually push down. When it did that, mountains rose. And so that's how we had the formation of mountains. Um, in that formation, of course, these are sedimentary rocks here, and that was a part of the deposits that occurred as a part of that inland sea. But with Glacier, as the Falloran Plate began to push the, the land up, those rocks came under pressure, and under pressure with sedimentary rocks, they actually uh, become metamorphic rocks, and they metamorphosize into much harder rocks. We call that uh, seto metamorphic rocks, and so those rocks became very hard and very, uh, and so that's what actually formed the mountains. So the mountains in Glacier National Park are much harder than these mountains over here in, uh, in the Badlands. So erosion happens on the order of about an inch a year here, whereas up in Glacier National Park is about a tenth of an inch every thousand years. So very different in terms of, of it. So anyway, so there was this interior series, the, the uh, subduction of the Fallowan Plate began to push this up and um, here are some other examples of, of the sedimentary rocks. This is actually from Okoshika Park. You can actually see these sedimentary lines right here of different, uh, different clays, silicas, chalks, uh, even coal embedded in here. And then you can see right over here, we have a very similar um, uh, place here where we've got the similar kinds of striations of rocks. You get, anyone know where this is? Yes, exactly. This is Mount Sharp on Mars. This is how we know Mars actually had 
um, a water um, basically was covered in water because there are these sedimentary rocks that look exactly like the rocks that you see in, in Makoshika State Park. And you also see this in Theodore Roosevelt North National Park. I was actually with a, with a ranger at, uh, at um, Theodore Roosevelt National Park and I was showing her this picture and she suddenly exclaimed, wait a minute, that's here. And I said, yes, that is here. And that's how we know that Mars is exactly like, like, uh, like Earth. So at some point in time, Mars was completely covered in water. There's just really no argument over that these days. All right, so, and we also have some really interesting things occurring. This is known as a thrust fault, and there are a lot of thrust faults in the park. So right about the time that that plate was being subducted, we also had what's known as a thrust fault. The thrust fault is where you actually have young rock, and then up through the young rock, we have older rock being pushed up. So this is a part of that subduction of that plate. Uh, this, this rock here is actually um, from the Plasticine period. And this is from the Cenozoic. So this is uh, a very, so this is much younger rock sitting on, uh, and, and older rock sitting on top of it. Generally in geology, you don't see that because generally you have younger rock sitting on older rock and you go down. So, and it's also kind of neat because you can actually see right along here, this is this line, this little uh, kind of fuchsia like line is where that fault exists. It's right there. That is actually the fault line right there. So it's kind of cool. And this is not just the only fault line like that in the park. There are several really interesting uh, 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 what we call thrust faults in the park. Then roughly about 8,000 BC, we had uh, indigenous peoples uh, moving into uh, the Montana, North Dakota, and uh, Wyoming area. North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming. This is, uh, this, uh, is actually outside of Champlain, um, South Dakota. This is uh, a, a, an homage to the uh, uh, Lakota women. Uh, and so this actually represents Lakota women at all stages of their life. But uh, just to know that the Lakotas and the Lakota, Dakota, the Cheyenne, the uh, Blackfeet, the Crow, Kuntai, and there are several other tribes in that area all inhabit these areas. They have their own nations, their own forms of government. So you actually are moving into an area where there's a different culture. Then 1803, if you recall that ocean basin that I showed you before, guess what the U Louisiana Purchase looks like? This is actually the area that we actually bought from the French. Uh, we only paid about 32 cents uh, an acre for 530 million acres. It just so happens it's almost exactly that, that basin that was there and that the French actually got tired of this. They didn't really want to protect it. And one of the reasons why is because the Indians actually called, uh, let me go back up, back the indigenous peoples of America called this place Mokoshika. And Mokoshika means the humble land or can also be interpreted as the badlands. And nobody wanted to go where the badlands were. And so the Americans or, or say the English, the French all kind of thought that this was actually worthless land. It actually turns out there was a lot of great wealth and great worth in that land, but the Indians were very clever in calling it Makosha because they didn't want, uh, want the Europeans moving into that area. So this is actually what our Louisiana Purchase was. Um, again, it's about 530 million acres of land, uh, which also the middle of it actually goes through Glacier National Park. So it's about, this is like almost the middle of the park right here. This is also right along the Continental Divide. Uh, so that's what happened. And then, so that actually is kind of what, uh, of course, in the, in the early 1900s is when we had Theodore Roosevelt, who actually signed uh, the, uh, uh, began creating a lot of national parks, created the national park system. And Glacier National Park was one of the very first parks to be uh, initiated by Theodore Roosevelt. In terms of what we did with astronomy, uh, I think it's really important to kind of note some areas. So I actually had them circled in red. First of all, there is the West Glacier area. This is actually where my, my astronomy program uh, actually ran. So it's, a, it's actually in the Apgar Village. There are two areas named Apgar, Apgar Village and Apgar Visitor Center. And we ran our solar observing in Apgar Village and uh, stellar observing in Apgar Visitor Center. There's this really cool road that kind of goes through the middle of the park. It's called Going to the Sun Road. And if you ever go to the Glacier National Park and you don't have a lot of time, the one thing you need to do is going to the Sun Road. It is absolutely spectacular. 
uh, and uh, all those uh, those uh, soaring peaks and uh, silhouetted against the Milky Way and the plunging valleys that I wrote in the and the uh, write up for the thing tonight is as you see that all along uh, going to the Sun Road. We'll talk about that a little bit later, and then also at the very end uh, we have the east um, part of the park. This is the St. Mary's Visitor Center. Uh, we also have an astronomy program that occurs there. Uh, and, and so we'll talk about that program as, the pro as we get on tonight. But again, if you're going along, uh, going into Glacier, you definitely want to make sure that you, you do go through going to the Sun Road. That's, the, that's probably the, the one of the most spectacular places. There are lots of other amazingly beautiful places there. I can't tell you how, how amazing they are. The pictures tonight are not doing enough justice to the idyllic beauty that you're about to see. So. But, Okay. Yeah, I, it's, you know, it's the, what we kind of work with, you know. If it was, you would definitely be able to read it here. Okay. All right. So when you go to Glacier, a couple of things I, I need you to consider. I'm going to give you some time to process that image. All right. You want to buy or went bear spray? Because when you enter Glacier National Park, whether you are not the apex predator in the park. And if you're a vegetarian, you are not the apex herbivore either. There are creatures there that are much bigger than you and are much hungrier. So you definitely wanna buy, you can also rent, you can rent bear spray. Uh, if, you, if you use it, of course you have to pay for it. But uh, I definitely agree that you need, to, you need to have it with you at all time. We had it with us at all time we were there. Now, just to let you know, I only saw one bear once and he was running across the road as I was going on going to the Sun Road and I didn't even have time to get my camera out and that was the only bear I got to see. So it's, it's not as, 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 as prevalent as you think it is, but they do forage in the morning and at night and early in the morning or you're there at dusk at night, they are there and you need to be very careful. Always keep your distance. Do not feed the bears at all, please. Do not, you don't leave food out for them or anything. And if you have food, even a stick of gum in your car, take it out. You don't want any food in your car at all. We've, I've seen pictures and stuff that of literally this one where there was a bear, there was a stick of gum in the glove box. That was the only food in the car. He got in the, he got in the truck basically went in the truck, the door slammed behind him and locked automatically. And the door, the bear completely tore the inside of the truck up trying to get out. So please, uh, you know, just be really careful. Um, so there are, and, and it's not just the bears. We, there are, of course, there are bighorn sheep, there are mountain goats. Uh, there's all kinds of animals there. You don't, you know, even though they're, they're cute and pretty and all that, please do not get near them more than about 25 feet. And if you are in the presence of a bear, you really need to either slowly back off, you know, don't run, but please you just be really careful. So def definitely that's something you need to consider. Um, plan ahead, uh, buy your passes in advance. So going to the sun, almost uh, many of the places actually require passes. So if you go on, if you want to do go going to the Sun Road, you need to buy a pass. If you want to go up to Pole Bridge and go into Bowman Lake, you've got to get a pass. If you want to go to um, East East Glacier and enter the park there, you need a pass. Mini Glacier, Two Medicine, a lot of the popular sites, you need a pass. There's a complete park pass that you can buy that's good for a year for seventy bucks. I think it's a pretty good deal personally. Uh, now I personally I got a I got a free pass that went to allow me to go to everything. So, but you know, unless you're a volunteer of the park, you're probably not gonna get that, so. Um, you're in the wild and can be injured or die. So please be aware. Now, that's, that's not just from animals, okay? We actually had very few, in fact, zero deaths from animals. But the biggest uh, issue in the park is drowning or falling. You're out, actually you're out, uh, uh, we had two experienced climbers try to make the summit of Dusty Star Mountain. Uh, they, uh, again, these are guys who had been experienced in the park, had been there many years, actually had grown up in the area. And their goal was to summit, make the summit of Dusty Star Mountain. And unfortunately they fell and died. And those are two, sort of two of the deaths. 
The other thing too is on going to the Sun Road, there are a lot of really cool waterfalls and they have them in such a way where the waterfalls are coming down the mountain and underneath the road. So they've actually built um, these really nice stone arches underneath the road so that the water can come down. They're really cool, they're idyllic. You can get out, you can actually get the water from the waterfall and everything. First of all, you don't wanna do that because there could be bacteria in there that could really eat your gut up. So you don't wanna really do that. But the thing is, is that we've actually, there have actually been instances where people got out, they went over to the waterfall and as they were doing it, they fell into the waterfall and the waterfall goes under the road out into the valley, which is about 7,000 feet down. So you yeah, don't want to do that, right? It's at various points. So we start at about uh, 2,200 feet at West Glacier, proceed to about 6,600 feet at Logan Pass, and then down to about 4,000 feet or more uh, at sea level. You'll see that in, in coming slides. I, I actually... Right, uh, right. And now the highest peak in Glacier is Cl Mount Cleveland, which is over 10,000 feet. So you can you can get some pretty tall mountains up there. And in Smoky Mountains, you can call feeding animals there. It's a five thousand dollar time. Yeah. And one hundred central prison in Boston. Okay. All right. See there, you are. You can be fined there in the park for violating park laws. Thanks for bringing that up, Frank. I do want to say that there have been people who have brought firearms into the park saying, okay, I'll use this to protect myself. Okay, so that's a very dangerous thing, um, it is, even though that is your second amendment right. Uh, the thing is, is that the bears are protected in the park. So even if you are attacked and you shoot a bear and kill it, that's fine, you live, but then you get fined. So it's really best to actually use a good protective measure like, uh, like bear spray instead of using- no, you do not spray yourself with bear spray. That would be a very bad thing. Uh, you know, yeah, what you wanna do is you wanna take the bear spray and what you wanna do is, is you wanna spray it in front of you and you kinda of wanna make a, a cloud wall like this so that the bear is gonna run into the cloud. So you don't wanna spray it at the bear. You kinda of wanna make a little wall kind of from the ground up that makes a wall so that the bear runs into or walks into the wall make sure that you're downwind, you know. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So yeah, let's hold it. Yeah. If you can, because I, I need to move on here. So wait, there's a lot, of, a lot more slides than this. Um, there is little or no internet or phone service. So out here, in, we are used to beautiful internet. We're used to being able to get to Google and, and get, uh, and get out and get information really fast. That's not there. Uh, and a lot, a lot of reasons why. Uh, number one, you are in a idyllic place. If we start putting um, cell towers on, on top of mountains and stuff like that, now there are a few on some of the mountains lower uh, that are outside of the park, but if you start doing that inside the park, you're gonna start messing up all that beauty. So we actually don't have that, okay? Uh, uh, they are working to improve that, I, I'll tell you, but it's just, uh, just remember that. And that's another thing. When you're out on the trails, you want to make sure that somebody knows when you went into the trail and when you're going to come out. And you want to make sure also, too, that you've got food, meds, gas, because all these things are a very, very long way off. Like today, if you, if you come out of here and you want to go to a gas station, closest gas station is probably about a mile down here near Peace College, right? Okay, closest gas station that actually had really jacked up prices was about seven miles away, but the one with the good prices was about 17 miles away. And if you wanted to go to Costco, that was 30 miles away. So uh, it's, things are a long way away. But if you're going out on a hike and everything, uh, Sean, you're an experienced hiker. I think you, 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 know, you, you want to make sure that you've got your meds. You want to make sure that you've got, if you are taking meds, you want to make sure that you've got plenty of water, that you've got food, that you've got survival gear in case you get caught. Um, you know, in, uh, you know, a snowstorm, which can happen there. Uh, so you want, really want to be aware of your environment because you can, you can die of hypothermia out there. But again, the big thing is falls. And, and uh, so you don't want to be taking a selfie on the, on the ledge, right? It's a cool shot. I agree, but a lot of people just kind of fall. Um, some of the other things to think about, we'll wait for the slides to catch up here. All right. Dogs and pets are not allowed on trails. Now for us, that was a big deal because we took our Boston Terrier with us and we couldn't take him on any trails. 
So a lot of these trails are long trails. So we were kind of limited in what we could do there. Um, so uh, we did get to do a lot of great things, but I'm just saying some of the really cool, like the hike to Grinnell Glacier or hike into the Hidden uh, Lake, stuff like that, we really couldn't do because it, it just um, was too much time to leave our dog alone in the, or whatever, or in the RV or whatever. So uh, we, uh, we couldn't do that. So remember that. Uh, enjoy the idyllic beauty. You're really there to enjoy the beauty. Uh, and so surfing the web and stuff like that is, you know, you really want to kind of leave that for when you get back. Um, vehicles over 20 feet may be restricted, for instance, on going to the Sun Road. If your vehicle is greater than 20 feet in length, you will not be able to take the vehicle on the road. So that's all there is. If it's wide, like if you have a big dually, uh, probably won't be able to go on, on it because the, the road is very narrow and, you know, you, you, won't, you won't make it around some of those turns. Uh, the air is dry. So that's really good for astronomers. No need for dew zappers. And all the equipment that we had there, there was no zoos, we had no dew zappers, if you can believe that. I mean, I didn't experience one night with a corrector plate doing over. It was beautiful. Uh, and then the astronomy is awesome there. All right, so just some of the areas that we were at. This is actually Bowman Lake, and this is a little town named uh, called Pole Bridge. This is actually all the tall buildings in that town. <laughs> there are only two big buildings, and there's some little cabins back there. But uh, this was a really great little place. Uh, the, they make fresh breads in the uh, mercantile. Uh, so that was really wonderful. You walk in there, they are making like, uh, they make a lot of stuff with huckleberry. Um, they make, uh, you know, like cheese and Parmesan breads. They're all fresh baked there. It's incredible. Um, over here in the little saloon, this is the Northern Lights Saloon. Uh, they have, it's a great little restaurant. They've got great food there. They had a little band over here playing uh, music and stuff. Debbie and I really loved hanging out there. That was a lot of fun. This lake, Lake Bowman, is, a, is, is, fed, is fed by snowpack and everything. Uh, it's, it's super clear water. The water up there is super clear. In fact, Flathead Lake and Flathead, Flathead River is actually considered, the, uh, I saw on, on the web, is now considered the clearest water in the world. So if you really want to see a clear, a clear water, go up there. It's, it's just incredible. And this is, is a shallow lake. You can wade out there pretty far. It's icy, but it's a lot, really refreshing. So definitely uh, we had a lot of fun there. Uh, this is uh, the chateau at, um, at Mini Glacier. Now our own Al Hamrick actually worked here uh, as, uh, one summer as a waiter. Uh, but, uh, right after he graduated medical school. Uh, but this is really little idyllic chateau that's nestled in this place called Mini Glacier. Uh, it was actually built by the railroad company. The railroads actually developed a lot of this land and a lot of the property in this area. So just this amazing mountain view back here. Uh, this one was actually right behind the chalet on the left side of the lake. I mean, just really was incredible. And then uh, this is over on East Glacier on the east side. Well, you know, this is one of the sunsets. So it was really amazing. All right. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, now let's back up and do some uh, uh, talking about astronomy. Uh, this is uh, we our first astro uh, astronomy stop uh, that a place that actually had an astronomy program was in the Badlands. Um, and so this is uh, Badlands National Park, uh, North Dakota, uh, South Dakota. Uh, it was really, they have really interesting peaks here. Now, the tallest peaks here are only about 1,200 feet. Those are the tallest ones. Uh, these are being worn down very quickly by wind, rain, and, and other forms of erosion. But um, it's really cool. These are really easy to get up and scamper over and everything. So a lot of fun to get out here and play around. Even Mr. Bentley, don't tell the rangers I put him out on a trail. But uh, even Mr. Bentley got out there and had a little fun out there. This is a lot neat. But one of the neat things that they have a nice astronomy program, it, this astronomy program runs every night. So um, if you're volunteering, it's a bit of, it's a, working nights, a bit, of, a bit of a rough thing. But what's really cool is they have this outbuilding where they actually store all their equipment. So all the equipment goes in here. It also has a forward screen over here. You can kind of see it in this picture where they have a really nice presentation every night. And they're seating roughly for about uh, 200 people or so. Um, it's a Bortle II sky, elevation is about 820 meters, which translates to about 2,600 feet. Um, so it's, it's really, uh, they have a nice little program. The skies are pretty dark out there. 
Um, that's probably the closest place you could drive if you wanted to really get into this. I mean, the, the scenery out here is just incredible. When you have the sun silhouetted, uh, sorry, uh, or behind the mountains, they're silhouetted against the sun. It's really incredible. As, again, lots of all, all, also too, it's a great place for exploring uh, some of the digs where they're uh, digging up fossils and stuff. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, creatures from the Cretaceous period are, are in, in this area. Um, I don't know if you guys read the, read the article in National Geographic this week about uh, they've actually found a lot of places where they think that the Chicxulub meteor or asteroid actually created a tidal wave and actually forced a lot of, uh, as it went up this, this inland seaway, actually dumped a lot of animals into certain spots and everything. So there's a lot of places where they're finding concretions and, and just dumping of animals uh, that from the Cretaceous period so that's pretty interesting. And you find a lot of really interesting fossil places. And these are places you can lure, you can walk out on the trails and, 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 and see, they just encourage you not to touch the, uh, the fossils and stuff like that. If you do find a fossil, they will get your, put your name up in lights. So that's a, that's a fun thing. Um, but nice little park, really enjoyed it a lot. Uh, and you know, you guys, if you plan on going, talk to me, I'll tell you all the really cool things to do out there. Um, this is the, uh, the team at Glacier, um, so uh, I want uh, to especially point out that this is uh, Debbie Smith, she is, now her, she has a humble title, it's Hudson Bay District Interpreter, but Debbie Smith is really directing all the interpretive programs at the park, she's really quite uh, uh, a planner, she really knows how to pull programs off and get teams working together, uh, and she's really a great person to work with. Um, on the right here, we have the East team. This is our, this is the plane wave telescope that we have at the Dusty Star Observatory. Uh, this is uh, uh, John Harrington, uh, who is actually an author and astronomer. This is uh, Glenn Torillo, uh, who um, is, uh, works on the East Side program. Uh, on the left here, the extreme left, uh, of course, this is, uh, this is a, the Dusty Star Observatory. It is a, it is a plastic or a, uh, observatory dome. We've got on both sides of this dome are two 60 inch uh, TVs that are, they're actually covered. And then before the program starts, they take the coverings off. So they're, they're not af affected by the wind or rain or anything like that. And so the, the crowd stands outside and they actually do the program out there and they can actually see uh, all the images that the telescope is, is pointing to are, are actually projected on TV. So that's what John is doing outside. Glenn has a couple of Dobsonians that he's got out there and people can go out there and look through Dobsonians for those people who have to look through an eyepiece. So uh, it's a great one. Um, on this right here, this is Bob Van Gundy. Bob is actually, he's actually uh, uh, went to, actually he graduated from UNC, but I still, he's still my friend. And then, uh, <laughs> but he's also went, uh, did a lot of work at, at North Carolina State around that area. Um, Bob is a, is a geologist, uh, he has his PhD in geology, and he's also an avid astronomer, so it's great having a geologist and an astronomer to bounce things off of, it's really great talking to Bob about all the, all the things that happened in the park uh, geologically. Uh, this is Mike Huckaluck, uh, I'll show you another picture of Mike in a second, uh, because uh, this is Mike and I, he's, this is actually the West Glacier team, uh, uh, the two of us. Uh, we got, uh, we are actually able to get some time on the, on the big scope, uh, near the end of the program. One of the problems we had uh, this year was that going to the Sun Road was closed at night. So it really made it difficult for us to get over to the scope, the, the way around the scopes, 100 miles. And so it's just made it too difficult to get over there and then come back. So it's a, it was a 200 mile trek. So we, we only, uh, but we did move over uh, kind of near the end of the program and got some time on the big scope, which was a lot of fun. Uh, really, uh, they're, they're using a product called SkyX to drive the scope with. And so, and then they're using Sharp Cap to drive the camera. The camera is, uh, for those of you who are in astrophotography, is an ASI 553i, uh, uh, which is the uh, MC cooled camera. So, yeah, uh, let me just say, I see Steve over there doing this. So, this is part of what the Conservancy has done. This is this whole uh, rig here and everything is about $50,000. They put quite a bit of money into that. Uh, and that's to promote science over there on the east side. They're really able to do some, and you'll see in just a minute about some of the really cool photos that we took over there. Um, this again, Mike Huckaluck and myself, we're the west side team. Now we would do solar observing four days a week, 
at the Apgar Village area. So this is us doing solar observing. This was a five inch uh, refractor, uh, Orion refractor. And I got to operate the, uh, the um, Coronado II um, uh, hydrogen alpha scope, which was a great little scope. It's a, about a $1,600 scope, even though it's only about that big, but it was really sweet. Um, uh, so that was, that was a lot of fun. But when the crowds send out, all we had to do was turn around and look behind us. And this is what we got to see. So this was a basically what was our, our office. So it wasn't a bad day, let me just say that. Uh, it was really pretty awesome. All right, uh, one of the nice things that the, the park, uh, the Conservancy also provides for us are these equipment trailers. So all the equipment that we use for the stellar observing and for the, uh, the daytime observing is actually stored in these trailers. They, uh, they're pretty sophisticated. The, of course, this, the back gate folds down and we can roll all the equipment out for setup and everything. On the top, they actually have a vent that pops up when the temperature gets too hot in the trailer and they basically run a fan. Everything's on a solar, a solar panel here and there's a battery in here that gets continually charged by the, by the panel. Uh, during the winter, they, these actually get uh, towed away and put up uh, in a barn so that basically they're, they're protected from the wind and elements. But again, this is something else that the Conservancy provides, and they also have a duplicate trailer over on the east side as well. So the Conservancy has actually put quite a bit of money into both of the, into the astronomy project uh, projects, uh, and of course I, we delivered for them. So just just to tell you, um, our in our program over on the on the west side, we we actually served about 5,100 people, almost almost 5,200 people, on the. Uh, east side was slightly more, but roughly between the two programs, we served probably about uh, about eleven thousand people um, through the uh, through the entire season. It was it, it, we had a lot of fun and had a lot of repeat uh, people coming back for repeat performances. For myself, I actually got to operate the Edge HD eleven uh, with a Starzona uh, um, Starzona um, Hyperstar attached to the scope. And then on mine, uh, our camera was the DS-16 uh, Sky Raider Malincam. Uh, so that was the camera that I actually got to operate um, with this, this uh, thing. Our program, we would basically kind of do the similar thing that they do at Dusty Star. I would have a monitor that uh, was attached to the camera. And we basically, I would, through sharp cap, I was displaying onto the monitor what was uh, being shown uh, through the, or it being viewed to the camera. Um, this is some of our people getting up here. This is our setup and everything. Here are the two telescopes that uh, Mike Huckaluck really uh, is, uh, was really more of a visual observer. So he was really, uh, really an expert at finding pretty much anything in the night sky. He was really quite good. Uh, and so he operated both the, this, the 10 inch daub over here and then a 14 inch daub. And they were really quite good scopes. Uh, we, we did, uh, at that night, the, when we started off, we would give a program. We actually had a standard program that the park uh, had that we ran on video. And then I would do a program, uh, some type of astronomy program as well. But we also did, were able to relate some stories of indigenous people. So it was really, for me, it was a learning experience to learn some of these, some of the sky lore of the Blackfeet. The Blackfeet were actually had quite a rich, very rich sky lore. Again, uh, these people have, uh, the, this, uh, the Blackfeet Nation has been there for over 10,000 years. Uh, they were there long before the, uh, we all appeared on the continent. And so, uh, and they really had, uh, had a really strong society. Now, uh, some of the sky lore, this is actually uh, kind of a depiction of one of the Blackfeet teepees. What's interesting is, of course, this, is, this uh, object here is the Big Dipper. This object is a depiction of uh, what they call the bunch stars. These are, this is the Pleiades. And then these are the seven, what are called the seven brothers of the seven lost brothers. And over here, I have a key right here so you can actually kind of understand what these depictions are. This again, this is the, the Big Dipper. These are the seven, this is the Pleiades. This is what we call the, the wolf's tail. We'll, we'll see that in just a minute. Uh, this uh, cross here is actually the St. Andrew's cross is what they use to uh, to depict Venus. Then we have the sun, the moon, and then this is many moons. What's really neat is, is that in their society, they use star lore to encourage their, uh, their own peoples to act well, good towards one another. 
the story of the seven brothers or the seven lost brothers. There's a story about brothers who were, had been disparaged by a tribe. They, were, they went without food. They went without clothing. And so they were uh, sent, uh, they went to the, to, in, into the sky and went to the sun and the moon and they begged for revenge on their, and their, on their fellows. And so what they, what they did was that the sky, uh, the sun actually turned them into the Pleiades. This is the bunch stars right here. And they were, and then um, for nine months out of the year, there was rain on the earth. Those are the times when the Pleiades, when you can see the Pleiades, but in the summer months, what are the times when you can't see the Pleiades, uh, it's dry. So there's no rain. So that was kind of the story. And this kind of was, was to teach uh, their people that you should always be kind and take care of members of your tribe and not let anyone be disparaged. So it was a kind of a nice story. Um, the other really cool story, this is the one of Devil's Tower. So one of the places that Debbie and I went, we did go to Devil's Tower, but in the Lakota, the Dakota, Dakota and Blackfeet uh, Skylore, this is not known as Devil's Tower. It's known as the Bear Lodge. And the story uh, does vary among the different tribes, but uh, one of the stories is, is that there were uh, seven brothers and their mother and father and a sister who went out hunting for the uh, for berries to eat, and one of the brothers uh, began eating a lot of berries, and of course bears eat berries, and he turned into a bear. He turned into a grizzly bear and started chasing them, and they ran up on this giant stump, and um, as they were on the stump trying to war fight off the bear, the stump began to grow, and it grew into what we call the bear lodge, um, and so the bear lodge, um, uh, so. Uh, and as the bear kind of grew up, um, he began scratching the sides of the mountain. And that's what created these scratches on Bear Lodge. Of course, we know that these are magma columns and these magma columns actually form kind of these high, uh, hexag hexagonal columns here. And that's, it looks like scratches, but these are actually magma uh, columns. Uh, anyway, the sky god uh, turned them into the, into the uh, Big Dipper. And so that's where they went. Uh, also, one of the things I learned about bears there, if you are ever, ever do encounter a bear and you're not sure what it is, whether it's a grizzly bear or a black bear, there's a very easy way to tell. What you do is you climb a tree. And when you climb a tree, we know that black bears climb trees and grizzly bears just push them over. So that's, that's one way to find out what kind of bear you're encountering. I uh, probably don't want to really do that, but anyway. Um, and then finally, we have the wolf's tail, which is a really cool uh, story. The wolf's tail is actually the Milky Way. And uh, this is not my picture. This is actually one of the artists in the park that went out and took this picture. It's just a totally amazing shot. Uh, this is one that we see a lot from Glacier National Park. But this is actually at the Logan Pass area. But on the wolf's tail, the wolf's tail is the road to heaven. And all these stars that you see in the wolf's tail are the campfires of those who have passed on that are traveling into heaven. So uh, it's kind of a neat story. All right. Um, at, uh, so after uh, our programs were over, we did have a star party out at Logan Pass. We were actually able to get the pass open for one night uh, on going to the Sun Road. And so this is actually, this is Mount Reynolds right here. Uh, with our um, a slightly one day old, uh, one day past half moon. We did uh, have some representatives from Blackfeet Nation. So they set up a TP there and they actually kind of regale the crowd with their, their star lore, which was really cool. I got to tell you, it was really neat. Another thing that we did during the star party was is that um, before they were actually able to uh, put people into kind of, a, um, I want to say a holding area, but on bleachers. And uh, this, so they gave a program before, uh, while we were waiting for it to get dark. And each one of us, um, we had a placard board where we wrote down what, what scope would be on what object. So people could actually see what's going to be on, what, was, what they were going to be able to look at in the scopes. The other thing that we did with this star party was is that before people actually went to the scopes, uh, that we took four astronomers, put them in four corners of the park, and actually gave a star tour and talked about what they were doing uh, uh, with the stars, now, the people that were on my uh, that were in my group probably didn't get the, the the best part because I actually started talking about the stars that were blowing up and were were being uh, were actually uh, you know uh, being uh, being uh, uh, um, were running out of fuel. So I, I tried to actually not just not just talk about the constellations and stuff, but let them know where there were some interesting objects. So 
All right, um, and then this is kind of the setup in the area. This is actually looking down Logan Pass. So if you ever go to Logan Pass, make sure that you look down the pass. That's one of the things you want to do. Um, this is Mount Reynolds again. Um, this is Mount Oberlin, I believe. And this is called the Garden Wall over this way. So it's some really amazing stuff. One of the cool things that I got to do uh, for the meeting um, was that we had, uh, there were a bunch of hikers up on a mountain it's over here on the right that we can't see it. But um, all you could see were lights coming down the mountain. And so basically I put the scope on the, on that, on that, on the hikers and I just um, cranked up the, uh, the exposure setting and everything. And then you could actually see the hikers as they were coming down the mountain. So I'll try to put some of this stuff out on my Flickr account. And so uh, you guys are welcome. I'll send a, a, a blurb out to the, the club email uh, and let everybody know where that's at. All right. Um, then um, after my, my stint at Glacier was over, um, I uh, was actually the, I was a featured speaker out at the Dakota Night Star Party uh, in, uh, in North Dakota. Now they have a very similar kind of, of uh, outbuilding there uh, with uh, seating for about 500 people. Uh, that's been their max they've had in the past. Again, this was their first star party after COVID, uh, but, uh, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, it's a, it was great. I was uh, able to give some presentations. Now this is their, how they do their star party. And we've talked about using this rope lighting before in our star parties. Uh, and I think it was pretty cool. Um, one of the things they did, all the scopes are back here and all the people parked out, out this way. So they all, uh, so you didn't have the scopes being disrupted by car lights and stuff like that. People had to walk along this path. Also in the one, this, the tent over here, they also had refreshments. So people loved to go in there. So it was a lot of fun. Um, now the next uh, the next slide is going to be a little grainy. This is actually inside the star party. Um, there are some uh, we uh, one of the guys had a unicellular scope. We had some other scopes like eight inch scopes. One guy had a fourteen inch uh, Celestron, which was out there. It's a pretty massive scope, so that's a massive one. But that was a lot of fun. Uh, they had about I think for this particular star party after starting after two years, I think they had about uh, I think three hundred ninety seven people, which was pretty good for the for the star party. All right, uh, if you're ever in uh, uh, the, uh, the park, the Theodore, National, uh, Theodore Roosevelt National Park, we literally where they say the Buffalo roam, the Buffalo just roam. And so they're not like cordoned off anywhere. So uh, literally the, this guy was just hanging around on the side of the road. He liked getting pictures and stuff. This uh, also too, um, the Buffalo just literally, uh, I was out walking Bentley and there was a Buffalo walking right through our campsite. You know, it's just like, okay. <laughs> Um, they do have a lot of wild horses there, so they're really uh, they're really cool. Um, I, and again, I'll put up some videos and stuff of the horses. They're amazing. And then, of course, the sky is totally amazing there as well. All right, now we'll get into some of the pictures and stuff. Uh, how many of you guys remember uh, the Sunspot AR3088 this summer? It was really active. We did have several times when Aurora were at the park, but unfortunately, it was cloudy. This was the one night that it was not cloudy. This, I didn't take this picture. Kiki uh, Daunt uh, from, uh, from East Glacier took it. It's pretty amazing. Uh, I was out there watching them, but my camera just wouldn't pick them up. Um, I was on the west side, and you could actually see the mountains silhouetted against the Barrar, so that was really cool. Um, this is uh, the Globular Cluster M10. I took this at Logan Pass. Um, this only a 15 second exposure with one frame, okay? And I got that <laughs> with one frame. So that was a lot of, that was pretty cool. Um, this is uh, M13. Um, I got this picture. Um, again, uh, this one is only, uh, it was only a 5.2 second exposure, eight frame stack though, for a total of 40, 42 seconds. So again, the, I mean, the sky was just really responding there. It's, it's amazing. Here is the ring nebula. Uh, the ring, we, we all do the ring quite a bit. I have never been able to capture the the central planetary, but if you look right here, the central planetary is pretty visible right there. So I was really happy to get that shot. Um, only 5.2 seconds with 38 frames stack. So it's pretty, uh, pretty good. Um, here is uh, the Dumbbell Nebula. Um, they also called it the Apple Core there. There's a few separate names, there are a few different names for the, for the objects. This is a little bit longer, four, uh, 15 seconds, no, and uh, just one frame. Uh, my one of my favorite complexes is the complex of NGC 30, 3307, M81, and M82. 
I just love this. Um, this was a, a, four, a 15 second exposure, 14 frame stack over on West Glacier. Now East Glacier uh, with, the, with the 20 inch plane wave, I only needed to do 10 seconds, 61 frames. Now I wanna tell you, I was under a bit of a, 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 some stress here because we had a 75% moon. We had a forest fire, which is a smoke, uh, had a severe smoke layer. And we had, uh, and then we also had wind. So I was really lucky to get this shot and it turned out really well. So I just love this. I mean, you really get to see where the pulsar is, this central rift in the galaxy. I mean, you can see like one, two, three, four really distinct chunks of the galaxy. It's just, this galaxy is not doing well. It's having a lot of problems from old M81 over here pulling it apart. So, but yeah, this was pretty awesome. Of course, I did get managed to get this from uh, from M81 from um, uh, off the plane wave. So it was a pretty, pretty spectacular shot. Love that one. Um, I do have to work on my core, not blasting on my core, but it's something just improvement, self-improvement for me. Um, here is uh, uh, from the West Glacier side. Uh, this is the Eagle Nebula. Um, this is only 15, uh, basically a 15 second one frame uh, shot right here. And you can, you can really see the pillars of creation really well right here. So it's pretty easy to pick this up out of just out of one 15 second one shot exposure. That's pretty nice. Um, and then here's the uh, here's M17, the Omega Nebula. Uh, there they, they, they like to call it the swan. And if you kind of turn it on its side, you can just look like a, it looks a little like a swan floating on a lake right there. There's, there's the gooseneck of the swan and the body and this would be the lake. So, so was a, that was a great one. And again, this was only 15 seconds, 11 frame stack. And then finally, oh, oh, sorry, a couple more. This is, uh, this is the M, uh, M51, uh, 10 seconds. Again, with, of course, a 20, 20 inch mirror, you can't, you can't argue with. Uh, 34 frames uh, stacked, uh, 30, 340 seconds total. That was great. I love this one. I love really interacting galaxies because this one, basically you've got the M, M, this large, larger galaxy is siphoning uh, uh, material off the smaller one. It's pretty cool. And then finally, uh, M101, uh, the pinwheel galaxy, I, I got a great shot. I had an even better shot of this, but then a satellite went through the thing. And I tried to let this thing go to see if it would stack out. And I could never stack that satellite out, so I just kind of restarted it. Uh, but uh, this, again, another 10 second exposure. All right, that's really kind of it. Um, I'll take any questions. I know we're right, kind of, I ended it right, almost right on time. So. Yeah. Go ahead. Wait for Ask the your question again. Uh, did you walk any hiking trails? And if you did, how long were they? And were they difficult or not? Yeah. So uh, that's a great question, Frank. So I, because we we had Bentley with us, we really didn't get to go on a lot of hiking trails. We did uh, we did hike the trail uh, to um, the uh, Hidden Lake. Which was really not. It was really cool, and the reason why it was really cool because it was it was actually uh, the middle of July, and there was still snow up on the on the peak. People were actually skiing and snowboarding off the off the uh, off the mountain there. Uh, we didn't uh, make it all the way up there because literally it was literally ice up there, and uh, so I really didn't have any shoes that actually had the grips that could actually get through the ice. So we turned around. It was only about a mile. We were only probably about another maybe. Uh, Maybe another uh, two tenths of a mile away from the from Hidden Lake, but I just didn't want to chance it with with the ice and everything. But that was really pretty. Um, but yeah, that was one. And then when we went to Lake Bowman, uh, we were able to. It had a short, really short trail that we could walk to the lake, and no one really questioned us about having Bentley out there with us. So we took him. But I again, this is one of the things we really didn't get to do next year when we go. We'll try to uh, develop a better strategy for managing what we do with with Bentley and everything. So, your elevation. okay. So the well, the elevation at Hidden Lake was was great. It's greater than sixty six hundred feet. At at Hidden Lake, Hidden Lake is the trail at Hidden Lake's actually right behind the visitor center at Logan Pass, and so you can go right up there. It's it's right behind. There. It's a pretty easy trail to to go. So, uh, Doug. When uh, you, you mentioned uh, or some of the pictures of the um, Aurora, uh, yeah. 
Did you act? Were you actually able to? I know you didn't capture them, but were you actually able to see any? Um, yeah, I was. I, I could actually see the aurora, and I, I got some pretty grainy ones with my camera. Um, but the uh, you could you could literally see it uh, the mountain silhouetted against the against the aurora. Uh, it's it, and just the the issue that we kept coming up with was that every time we actually did have a really good CME hit the. Uh, hit Earth's atmosphere, it was cloud for whatever reason. We got clouds those nights, so that was the one night uh, in August, late August, that we were actually able to get aurora. But they do get them on a on a regular basis. And as we're coming up, I mean, we're we're just coming out of solar minimum now. Next year ought to be spectacular. Thanks. Any other questions here in the room? I don't see any in the chat. Uh, uh, got one Brian. back here. Hold on one second. Is How cold was it up there? Uh, I'll tell you. If you can ask that question in just a second. Go ahead, Rod. I was curious if there was any astronomy during the winter months. Uh, yeah, uh, no. <laughs> uh, in the winter months, there at at uh, at, uh, at Glacier, I mean, the snowpack's like thirty feet. So it's it's the, they don't the, the the observatory has been packed up, and it's it's a it's completely like encased in plastic and it's completely not used. It's closed for now. So we're not we don't have any astronomy. It, it's funny. It's during the winter months. Of course, we're looking uh, kind of out into into interstellar space, and all those really cool D, DSOs that we get uh, during the winter months do. We just can't get because the snow is so massive there. Uh, this year it was so big that uh, they weren't able to open the park on going to the Sun Road until 12th of July. Usually they're much earlier, like June or something like that. So, go ahead. Yeah, we got a question from Jim uh, online. Doug, um, that's awesome. Uh, very jealous. <laughs> what was it like to live in an RV in the park for that long? Okay, so let me just say one thing. Um, if uh, you, you really need to be solid in your relationship, because <laughs> you can't get away from one another. <laughs> now, you know, it's super that uh, Debbie and I have a great relationship, um, and we had a, we had a blast. Um, so uh, we, the, uh, let me just say this, the Conservancy was very generous. They put us into an RV park. They paid for the, the RV uh, area. It was a very nice uh, location, um, very pretty park. So yeah, that was it was it was a lot of fun, and we Debbie and I had a blast together out there. Just and there's all kinds of things to do there. I haven't gone into all the little places that you can go to, you know, shops and stuff you can go eat. There's like all ton, tons of little art galleries around in uh, in Pole Bridge, and so uh, and also in Whitefish. So it, it was a it was a it's a, you can have a great time. There's a lot that you can do there, and, and you can do a lot for three and a half months and not even scratch the surface. Go ahead. Hey, Doug, I got a question. Sure, Mike. Um, what? So I'm curious, what was the scene like there, being scene. at that elevation? I mean. Oh, the scene? Yeah. yeah, the scene was, like, totally amazing. It was, like. Um, uh, I have an artist there. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard to say. You know, it, it, it was a Bortle II sky. Um, but you know, uh, I had up there on the on the SQM meeting it, meter. It was like twenty one point nine seven, literally close to a bore one. I do want to say that the Glacier National Park, the entire park, is a, a dark sky park. It is certified by the Dark Sky Association, and they do a lot of work in making sure they monitor the lighting. They make sure that if there's any issues with the lighting, they want to keep that down because having that international dark sky certification. Is really important. It is a big draw to, uh, to the park. Um, so, and even the there are several, um, uh, I should say, privatized areas of the park, and even the members of the privatized areas uh, do cooperate with that because they know that brings people in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at, there were times when we did get, um, but. Uh, and then also too, uh, kind of later in the season, issues with with forest fires, smoke haze, and stuff like that. But you know, smoke haze can actually enhance some of the things you're looking at. I th I think that smoke haze actually works in your advantage when you're looking at, at galaxies and stuff. I have a tendency to pop a little more. So, 
um, yeah, you can you can use some of those to your advantage also too. If you have a moon, a night with a lot of moon, that smoke haze can kind of cut down the contrast. You don't have to have as fast an exposure on the on the camera to before you can capture it. I did. I will tell you that the moon uh, we observed really relatively very little moon because the moon was super low in the horizon. So it was all actually in the trees most of the time. So I have a question. Um, what was your most memorable outreach experience? <laughs> well there there are that's that's an interesting question um so for those of, of you if you didn't hear that on zoom Anna asked me uh, what was my most memorable outreach um situation i had a couple of uh, memorable situations number one uh probably the scariest uh one i had was with a fellow who came into the park so the scariest thing that i saw there was not it was not an animal it was a human and this guy actually had, um, he had uh, three ammo packs pasted to his, his, his vest, and he had a handgun right here. Um, and let me just say, these are allowed in the park, but uh, whenever you see an individual who's kind of sporting a handgun, he's very visible and everything, it, you have to wonder, what's this guy up to? But we didn't have any problem with that, so, but that was, I was, I was uh, immediately apprehensive about that, you know, I, of course, we was calm and we talked uh, jovially, but uh, it was it was a concern, you know. But I only saw one person like that out of out of the nearly you know fifty two hundred people that came through my program. <laughs> exactly. Now I gotta say we had some super excited people. We had a group of people who came through. Uh, they actually uh, we had several people who were repeats that would come through. They loved our loved our program. We actually had one group that decided they went, I had encouraged them to reach out to their astronomy group uh, in Rapid City and the, the, the group had, had uh, actually uh, been disbanded. And so they decided that, that um, they were going to start their own astronomy group. So that was, a, I was really excited to hear about that. So that was pretty neat. Uh, we had a lot of, a lot of great people, uh, met a lot of uh, newlyweds uh, that were actually on their honeymoon. So that was kind of a, a, a great place for people to kind of cement that relationship. Um, we had people from, from, uh, from France, um, Poland, Italy, um, and then of course, a lot of folks from, from the US. I, one of the things that, that, uh, that kept frustrating my, uh, my, my partner, Mike Huckaluck was, is that I daily met people from North Carolina. So a lot of North Carolinians went there and he was saying, where are all you people from North Carolina coming from? I said, well, they're coming from North Carolina. But <laughs> we did have a lot of folks from North Carolina. What was the name of the conservancy? Okay, it's called. It's actually called the 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 uh, the, the Glacier Park Conservancy. Uh, I had I have a picture of it on the van, uh, but uh, and I gotta say that conservancy is super because again they provide so much money and they're supporting sciences in the park. So we're talking about botany, we're talking zoology. Um, uh, all the uh, studies of birds and bird populations, plus astronomy, plus restoration of, uh, of historic buildings, plus um, the encouragement of, of teaching Indian lore and, and um, encouraging uh, learning with respect to indigenous peoples. So that was a really super um, experience and I think it's, it's one of the really neat, I liked it because it was comprehensive. They were getting all the sciences, plus they were getting culture in. So it was a, a really, a, a, it was, it's a great conservancy. It's a super uh, uh, program to be involved with. I was really honored to be, to be selected for that program. Yep. So Doug, we've got a question coming in from Facebook. Uh, what type of service power was available or needed to power um, uh, life as well as the telescope requirements okay so uh you know um i actually i brought my uh my i have a little rock piles rock pals um lithium battery which is about a 78 watt uh, watt hour battery um and uh, that that ran the ran the tv and the telescope all night long and so it was it was super um, at uh, and the same kind of similar, we used we used uh, basically rechargeable batteries. Uh, we had rechargeable battery packs to to run telescopes and stuff like that, so they, they could be re recharged very quickly. Um, and you got to think uh, with a program that starts at 10 p.m. 
and last till say like 2 a.m. or whatever, we, we, would, we would stay until people went home. Technically, we were supposed to stop at 12, so it was only a two hour program, but we, we would stay literally many nights, one to two, as long as people were there and they wanted to observe, we would stay out there and observe with them and show them really interesting stuff. So the, again, the Rock Pals, it's, it's not the top of the line unit. It's, it's only about this big, the little lithium battery uh, pile. And again, I think it's a 78 amp hour battery. It, it lasts more than enough time to, to run a TV monitor, run a telescope all night long, pretty much all night long. Anybody else? Go ahead. Yeah, oh. I was just wondering, are, are there other national parks that uh, the conservatory operates at? Uh, thanks. Uh, so each one of the national parks um, pretty much will have their own conservatory. Some of them have one and some of them don't. Um, I'm not familiar with what, what they were doing in South Dakota. I do know they had a supported program there. And uh, so that one uh, also provided equipment out there with that program. When I was with... Um, I do know that um, that there is a program, there is a conservancy for Grand Canyon. There is um, uh, there is something going on with. I'm not sure exactly what what they were doing at Theodore Roosevelt, but they also had equipment and stuff there at Theodore Roosevelt, and they did you know they were um, uh, they did a great job at pr uh, providing um, places for all the astronomers that came, uh, and so uh, and they and they also did. Um, uh, they also had scopes and stuff themselves that they set up as well. So they have, they have quite an interesting program there. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, literally uh, uh, getting in contact with these, uh, with these heads of these programs and stuff like that, I, I say it's, it, it's, it's great for a super summer. I mean, when we went to South Dakota, there was a lot more than just the Badlands that we were at. We went out to Wall, we went up to we went up to, to Rushmore, we went to Crazy Horse, we went, of course, we then went right, right into Wyoming for, um, you know, for Devil's Tower and everything. So there's a lot of stuff to see in those areas. Um, I just didn't go into all of it to, at the, in the meeting. Right? Did you see any UFOs? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I didn't even see Sasquatch. So there you go, you know. I, you know, but I would have had my bear spray. <laughs> there you go. Okay, well, Doug, thank you. Unless right. there are any other questions, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Great to be back.